Hey everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter here with a very late what happened in February 2022 in paleontology. And apologies for that just up front. Lots of sicknesses, lots of me being gone for field work. So apologies for that. Hopefully we'll do better this next month. With that in mind, there were some interesting things in February. So let's get started on what was going on with those. So starting, it's actually a paper more on geology than specifically paleontology, although it does use some paleontology to help prove its point, which is that the Cretaceous ended in spring, meaning the comet that hit the planet hit the planet in spring. And so that could have also been one of the causes for the extinction being as severe as it was, as that could have been very disrupting to a time when a lot of animals are trying to breed and also plants are starting to bloom. So it may have really disrupted the normal cycle of life that occurred during the late Cretaceous. However, how were the researchers able to prove this? Well, they were actually able to look at certain structures in some fish that were found immediately adjacent to that extinction. And by immediately adjacent, I mean partially within some of these layers that were formed by the impact. And we can tell this because there's very small glass sphericals in some of their gills. So essentially the impact would have happened, lots of dust and stuff would have been thrown into the atmosphere and as it rained down it would have melted into these glass spheres. Those that entered the water and some of the fish would have gotten those in their gills as they were swimming. So we know these fish were around when that impact happened and it probably killed them. <laughs> now there are certain structures in fish bones that actually do correlate with certain times of year based on how developed the growth rings are. And so they were able to look at these and essentially assume that these fish died in spring at least in the northern hemisphere it was spring, it would have been fall in the southern hemisphere, which again, like spring, it's when a lot of animals are trying to essentially change their behaviors, many plants are going through certain changes, and so that kind of impact at that very somewhat delicate time is probably what led to this extinction being as severe as it was. I will also say the lead author does have a video on this up on their own channel, so check that out because she explains it a lot better than I could. Staying in extinctions, there was also a paper on the end Permian extinction, which was the most severe in Earth's history. And they actually looked at a lot of different things that essentially summarize what happened during this extinction, with some of the main points being the loss of massive amounts of life, up to 94% of life in the oceans, and around 75% of life on land. Now this extinction has been largely attributed to the eruptions of the Siberian Traps Large Igneous Province, which is just a large series of volcanism that occurred near Siberia. And actually there's a lot of metals that are still mined there today because these traps, these volcanic traps, were just so massive. So it's a really great resource for us today, but in the past it really wasn't so great for life. And there's a lot of reasons for this. First, a lot of the other rocks that were surrounding this were carbonates, and that released a lot of CO2 as they heated it up. Additionally, there were gases caught inside of the lava that were also released. So greenhouse gases like CO2 raise the temperature of the earth, causing massive amounts of global warming. However, then again, there were also a lot of these halogen gases, which depleted large parts of the ozone layer. So it's really kind of a twofold thing as far as just the gases are concerned. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of metals that are mined there, and a lot of those metals got into the atmosphere as well. And those would have poisoned many different ecosystems around the world. Additionally, it helps to show that there is probably a much earlier onset to the extinction on land. In fact, it suggests that the land-based extinction happened about 60 to 370,000 years earlier than the marine extinction. And that's not entirely understood as to why that's the case. Hopefully there will be more research so we can understand that because as we do see more climate change today, it is going to be important to try and understand what was going on in the past so we can try and better prepare ourselves for the future. And pivoting back to the end Cretaceous extinction, there's also a more complex picture of this because of similar things to the Siberian traps, and that's the Deccan traps which were similar large volcanic systems, except these ones were from India. And those have been attributed with some parts of the extinction, although it's been hard to tell exactly what was the case and how influential they were on the extinction. This paper looked at late Cretaceous sediments in China, and essentially was looking at what the geochemistry of these sediments actually was. And it finds that there were a lot more metals than would have been expected, and that many of these probably came from the Deccan traps. This could implicate that at least within parts of China, the Deccan traps did have a direct influence on the extinction that happened there. Now there's still going to be a debate about this. For example, even in this paper, they do show that there are different stages of life transitioning into different forms being more dominant or less dominant. So what that means is that there's just not a fully understood mechanism for why some of these changes are happening. Additionally, there's still a lot of work going on near the Deccan traps. For example, also this past month, 
there was a fruit found in an inner trappian bed, which means essentially as these traps erupted, they would lay down one big layer of lava. But then after a while that would subside and you'd start getting sedimentary layers in between these. And in one of these beds was preserved a fossil fruit, specifically of the family Euphorbiaceae, which is actually related to some modern trees like rubber trees and castor oil trees. So it's actually really exciting to find this before the full onset of the Cretaceous mass extinction, because that means they were probably evolving before that extinction rather than developing afterwards. And moving into new animals, there is a new mammal found from the j -hole biota. This one has been named Cocotherium geofutangensis, and it actually helps to shed a, quite a bit of light on mammal evolution, specifically because of how its jaw is structured. Meckel's cartilage is a cartilage that runs along the jaw of most animals, but in mammals, it's pretty much turned to bone, and this animal starts showing some of that evidence where the Meckel's cartilage isn't fully ossified into bone, but it's at least starting to get there. This is a very important development in mammal biology, because as that ossified and became harder, it meant that parts of the middle ear that were associated with the jaw could detach from the jaw and become parts of the middle ear, which gives mammals much better hearing than most other animals on land. This makes Cocotherium one of the most important transitional fossils for understanding how the inner ear of different mammals started to evolve, and could potentially help us understand where mammals actually got their start, but that's gonna take even more research happening. And while we're still on the subject of the late Cretaceous, there's also been a lot of debate about how connected places like Africa and Europe were during the late Cretaceous. And that's because during the late Cretaceous, we do start finding some of these groups starting to migrate from one continent to the other. And this includes now in parts of Spain, specifically in the Pyrenees Mountains, where in late Cretaceous sediments from about 70 million years ago, there's been a new sauropod found. And this sauropod doesn't have a name yet because it's too partial, but we can at least tell that it is more related to animals like those from Africa. This means that Europe and Africa probably weren't as separated as we normally think. And there's been a few other data points of animals that again, are kind of doing this moving from continent to continent thing. And so again, what that means is just that these continents were probably a lot closer than at least some of the geologic evidence would suggest. And the animals were able to get around to this kind of archipelago that was Europe during late Cretaceous pretty well. There's also a new Opabinid, and for Opabinia, you can check out our video on that animal specifically, and then our addendum, because there was another thing found that was related, but still slightly different. This one, though, is very closely related to Opabinia. In fact, it appears to have many of the same structures, including the structures of fins along the side, the kind of sticking up tail fins, five eyes on the head, and then what looks like it's probably a similar proboscis-like trunk with a claw at the end, although in this animal, it's cut off because it wasn't preserved as well because it's not from the Burgess Shale like Opabinia. It's from the Wheeler Shale in Utah. Now this new one is named Utahora camosa, and like I said, it's not quite as well preserved as many fossils of Opabinia are. But Opabinia was long considered to be this kind of evolutionary loner without many other animals that are closely related to it. And now at least in the phylogenetics of paleontology, it wasn't quite as alone. There were some animals that were pretty similar, although it does seem like they all went extinct during the late Cambrian. There was also a new Spinosaur found, and this is not the Spinosaurus paper that suggests that it was actually a swimmer or had very dense bones, although I will get to that paper in my margin review. This video is being recorded after this, obviously. What this paper is about is a new Spinosaur coming from Portugal, and it's very, very incomplete, and it's one of those things that's very frustrating about Spinosaurs is that despite seemingly hanging so much time around water, they seemingly never get preserved very well or at least almost never get preserved very well. There's a few isolated specimens like that Spinosaurus specimen and like Baryonyx that are pretty well preserved, but this one is much more in line with other Spinosaurs. This one has been named Iberospinus natar ioi. Now, some of these are because of unique traits despite how partial it is, like the arrangement of the foramen on the tip of the snout, which would have allowed blood vessels and nerves to pass through that part of the bone and into the skin. And so while this animal we can't really define very well because again, it is so partial, we can at least tell that it's different than other Spinosaurs that have already been found. But this new find may suggest that the European archipelago that existed during the Mesozoic may have been kind of a cradle for Spinosaur evolution because there's a lot of them that have been found there, including things like Iberospinus, but also Baryonyx and Riparovenator. So there's a lot of diversity coming from just Europe and still a lot of diversity coming from elsewhere, but not nearly as much. So that may mean that their origin point was in Europe rather than elsewhere, somewhere else around the globe. 
There's also a new, relatively large pterosaur found from Scotland named Jark Skianak. And the name is in traditional Scottish Gaelic, which is why it looks like it's not spelled the way it's pronounced. And that actually makes a lot of sense, because not a ton of fossils, and especially of pterosaurs, have actually come from this part of the UK. I say relatively large because it had a wingspan of around 2.5 feet, meaning that it would have been around 8 feet or so. But importantly, looking at the bones, they were able to show that this animal was still growing, so it potentially could have reached even larger sizes. And that's unique because this is from the Jurassic, when not quite many pterosaurs had actually gotten that large. This is mostly because most of the pterosaurs at this time, including Jark, were Ramphorhynchids, which the most Ramphorhynchids we have are of Ramphorhynchus, many of which come from the Solnhofen limestone, and none of which are particularly large. This one though is much larger than any of the others, and really helps to show that even some of these early pterosaur groups, like the Ramphorhynchoids, were able to still reach large sizes even by the Jurassic, rather than large sizes in pterosaurs only being achieved by the late Jurassic or the Cretaceous, as was believed before this fossil was described, because it comes from the middle Jurassic. And now moving to papers about animals that have already been described, but this is new research on those animals. We actually have one on Shringrosaurus, which we have an entire video on Shringrosaurus, so feel free to go check that out. It's a very interesting animal. And this paper does do at least some new things in giving a full osteology and essentially what the bones were like that we do have of it, rather than just a preliminary description like many of those other papers suggested. Now, this also means they ran it through a new phylogeny, and they found out pretty much the same thing that I already mentioned in that video, it just specifically puts it even closer to as Hendosaurus. But it also starts finding some features that actually are somewhat in common with dinosaurs, meaning that as it is further studied and some of these other Hendosaurs are further studied, we could potentially better understand how the Archosaurus developed into dinosaurs in the first place. Because Shringosaurus is from slightly before the first dinosaurs may have evolved. So it could have some of these traits that were then passed down in another lineage to the dinosaurs. And understanding this broad evolutionary history could help us understand why today, out of what was once a very diverse group of archosaurs, why all we have now are crocodilians and the birds. Kinshiosaurus is sometimes called Pinocchio Rex because it had a very long snout, and that's obvious just by looking at it. However, there's also a lot of smaller features that require more detailed study. And that's what this paper did. They took a more significant look at parts of the skull of Kinshiosaurus. And what they found were some things that were in line with the initial description, but also some new features that can help define some of the different tyrannosaurs from one another. One of the first features they found that are in line with the initial description is a window-like antiorbital fenestra, which is the big hole that would have essentially lied in the skull just in front of the eye. It also had a short premaxilla, which is on the very tip of the bottom jaw. They do also mention though that a closely related tyrannosaur, Alioramus, doesn't actually have a described predentary though which means if it also had this shortened predentary, that wouldn't be a unique trait to Kinjiosaurus, but to this group of Tyrannosaurs, meaning it's still useful to mark down many of these features, even if they may not be shown to be totally unique in the future. There's also other features though that were seen, such as a prong in the squamosal bone, which is where the lower jaw connects to the upper jaw. And so this just gives us a better understanding of what was happening with Kinjiosaurus and some of these somewhat long-nosed or at least long-snouted Tyrannosaurs and hopefully we can try and figure out what they were doing, because their morphology is somewhat different from those in other Tyrannosaur groups. And so they were still pretty diverse, it wasn't all just things like Tyrannosaurus rex. And understanding their evolution could help us understand the different evolutionary pressures that were occurring on different environments and ecosystems during the late Cretaceous. There was also new research on Kung Peng Opterus, which made some headlines last year as potentially being the first pterosaur found with an opposable thumb, meaning it could grab onto things. But now there's also been finds, not necessarily of important features like that, but of stomach and digestive contents. And what that means is we can potentially start to understand what their diets may have been. And there's only two of these, so it is a very limited selection, and they very well could have had much, much broader diets. Again, the sample size of two is not very good. If we find more, then we could talk about saying they were a specialist. And the reason that I say they may have been specialists is because the two samples of stomach contents we have are remarkably similar, with one having little fish, and that was in a juvenile Kung Pengopterus, and then another one having slightly larger fish in an adult Kung Pengopterus. So it seems like they may have just been fish specialists, with larger animals able to eat larger fish and smaller animals able to eat smaller fish. It's not the most complex thing in the world, however again, it's only a sample size of two.
we really need more data points before saying with more certainty that it definitely was a specialist. There was also an entire separate video I did on new research on Fukui Venator Paradoxus, which the paradox is kind of coming in real handy right here because it's been placed as a lot of different types of Solurosaur, which are the more bird-like dinosaurs, but also includes things as large as Tyrannosaurus rex. So they were slightly more bird-like than things like Allosaurus. This paper actually suggests that Fukui Venator was the earliest branching Therizinosaur, which the Therizinosaurs were pretty large, at least some of them were, including things like Therizinosaurus, which was massive and had long claws to help pull down branches because it was actually entirely herbivorous. Now, Fukui Venator probably wasn't entirely herbivorous, it was probably more of an omnivore, but you can at least start seeing some of the traits that would lead to more herbivory in the later Therizinosaurs. And so this is actually a really cool find, and again, like I mentioned with the paradox coming in handy, is pretty unexpected to actually find this early branching of a Therizinosaur. Now, they go into a lot of detail on a lot of the different bones, so I will still recommend you go check out the video that I made on this paper specifically, because I think it's really interesting. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Um, you know, sometimes life is like that. I, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, this next month I'm going out to the field again, so we'll see how we get done with the March script. I also have a poster I need to present, finish and present, and I have a um, another geology project I need to finish. So it's gonna be wild. Uh, for the patrons, obviously we didn't get a what the hell is this, so you'll get two when we have time. Probably in May, because that'll be when I actually do have more time. Uh, so we'll double that up. Which also means there's never been a better time to be a Patreon. <laughs> a patron on Patreon. Yeah, again, like, sorry, life's like this sometimes. Uh, apologies. That in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, uh, and you know, don't go extinct.